everyone. Welcome into lecture number 20 of differential equations. This lecture is on impulse functions. So let's start with some setup here and talk about what we even mean by an impulse function. So let's consider, and I'm going to define an impulse function by defining the function, then we'll see what we mean by the impulse part of this. But let's consider a function uh, which we'll call d sub tau, uh, that is a function of t. So here tau is going to be a constant, a parameter of this function. So it's a parameter. And so the idea here is that this function d sub tau is going to represent uh, a what I'm going to call a proportional impulse over a constant interval. So, and then and once we define this, we'll see what the proportional what the proportional means here, right? So, a proportional pulse over a fixed interval. And so the interval here is going to be, so for this function, the interval is going to be from minus tau to tau. So t is going to be between minus tau and tau. And the proportional part of this is that we're going to want the graph of the function uh, for any tau to have area, so, so the integral to be 1, basically. We want the integral to be 1. So this is our desire. We want the integral, the total integral, from minus infinity to infinity, of d sub tau of t to always be 1, all right? But this function is going to be defined in a very specific way that this fact right here, this integral fact, is just going to come out of our definition. And so we're going to define then our function d sub tau by the following piecewise formula. So d sub tau of t is going to be equal to 1 over 2 tau. So 1 over 2 tau, constant though, that's a constant. And this, it'll be defined by this uh, when t is between the impulse range, right? Negative tau and tau. And then it's going to be 0 otherwise. And we can sketch a graph of this function. So this is going to be like a rectangular, uh, what we're going to call a pulse or an impulse. So here's our d sub tau. Here's our t. If our tau is maybe, say, this, this amount, whatever this is, so tau in each direction from the origin, and then our height, if this is tau, then it's maybe 1 over 2 tau is about here, right? 1 over 2 tau is the height of that is about here. Then the idea is that this function is constant equal to 0 outside of this interval. And it's constant with a height of 1 over 2 tau above the interval, right? And so now you can see that if you were to take the integral here, the integral is just going to measure the area of this rectangle and this rectangle has a uh, base of 2 tau and a height of 1 over 2 tau so the area of this is definitely the area of this is definitely 1 right and so the integral and this is just a, a step function really right this is a step function um, it's defined a little bit differently than the step functions we studied in the last lecture but it's very similar though so it's a step function um, it's, it's very simple right constant step function and so clearly then this integral is going to be equal to 1. And so that checks off that box there, right? And it's a symmetric impulse. Now, why do we call it an impulse? Because the reason is because if we allow this tau, right? If we allow tau, well, let me draw this on the other side, right? If we allow this tau to get smaller, to, to approach 0, so take the limit as tau approaches 0 from the right, then actually the entire interval is going to compress, right? And so as the interval compresses to make sure that this area remains 1, then 1 over 2 tau is going to be a little higher, right? And so maybe I'm not drawing this perfectly proportionally. But the idea is that as we squeeze the uh, domain space down here, right, as we squeeze the t values, the height of the, of the rectangle has to get larger and larger and larger. And as we squeeze so far that we're getting a close to 0, then our function the value of our function is going to have to grow accordingly, right? Inversely, really. It has to grow inversely. And so what ends up happening is that as you take the limit, as tau approaches 0, the value of that function, quote-unquote function, this is still a function right here, d sub tau, the value of this function is going to have to approach infinity, right, to make sure that we, um, that we obey this formula. So for any very large tau, this will be a function. But in the limit, actually, this is not a function. And you can think about why that is. I mean, I've kind of just given, given the uh, obvious answer here, right, of why it's not a function. But 
in the limit, the integral is still equal to one here, right? So let me write all this out. This is the idea though. So we start with just this kind of rectangular step function. We take a limit as the symmetric interval squeezes down toward the origin. And the result is that if we wanna maintain, if we wanna maintain this property, that the area underneath this curve, right, this function is equal to one, then the result is that th this uh, value of the function has to grow, right, inversely with the limit and it has to grow to infinity. So here's what we end up with. Um, we get the following definition. So this is gonna be called the, the delta function uh, or the Dirac, Dirac delta function, uh, but it is not a function, okay? So let's write it this way. So the Dirac, that's a person's name, delta function, and I'm gonna put function in quotes here, but the Dirac delta function is defined by, all right, delta of t is equal to the limit as tau approaches uh, zero from the right of this function d sub tau of t that we defined up above. So I'm not gonna rewrite the definition of d sub tau, we've got it right here, but it's defined to be the limit as t approaches zero from the right, I mean, t sorry, tau, tau approaches zero from the right of this d sub tau function. So that's that's what we, how, that's how we define our delta function. And so the properties of the delta function then, so it has the following properties. These are kind of defining properties in a sense as well. So the defining properties are then that uh, delta of t is equal to zero for all t not equal to zero. Uh, delta of t is going to be undefined, or if you wish, you can say that it equals infinity, but it, you know it, that doesn't really mean anything. So, but it's undefined. Uh, but then the defining property is that so this function is zero everywhere except for at t equals zero, and its integral is equal to so its integral over the entire real number system is equal to one. All right, and so the re the way that that's possible to build such a function is exactly as we've described, right? And there's other ways to set this up using uh, ex exponentials and stuff, but um, using this rectangular method, it's very clear geometrically to see what's going on. You have little rectangles, you squeeze the base, you want to keep the area constant, and so you end up with, in the limit, you end up with this delta function, which obeys these two following properties, that uh, delta of t is zero everywhere except for the origin, and its integral over the entire real number system is equal to one. Okay, so this is what we're going to call the delta function. Um, and we're going to now work with this. We, what we want to do next is talk about the Laplace transform of this function. So let's do that now. This is item two. We're going to do this in a, a couple of steps here, um, and then we're going to uh, arrive at another kind of interesting, another interesting property of this delta function. Delta function is actually something called a distribution. If you ever study this. Um, in another class, but I'll write this down up here. So the delta function is not a function, but it is something called a distribution. It's kind of a prototypical distribution. So you might see this in a, in a differential equations class moving forward, so partial differential equations or a functional analysis or something. You'll see this delta function used again. All right, so now let's try to take the Laplace transform of this delta function, but first let's kind of generalize it a little bit. So we can always shift the impulse. So the impulse, by the way, uh, the impulse is happening at the origin for this delta function. So the delta function represents an impulse of unit force. So the integral here represents the force of the impulse. All right. And so when that force is spread out over, over, uh, you know, quote unquote, relatively large interval, then we have, you know, obviously you can see the finite, uh, in the, you know, moment, momentary, I don't know, it wouldn't be the force, but the, 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 power of it is one over two tau, right? And as you take the limit, so then you have this, this unit force, this unit impulse happening at just at the origin. But the point that I was trying to make before I distracted myself there was that um, we can move this pulse. We might not want this pulse to happen at the origin. We might want this pulse to happen somewhere else, right? And so we can shift it. So well, let's do that now, right? But we can shift the impulse to any t value 
So we can shift the impulse to happen at t equals to t naught for some, it could be still be zero, but could, it could be anywhere now, right? And so then the defining properties of our function, right, are that delta of t minus tau is equal to zero for t not equal to t naught, so not tau, t minus t naught, right? Um, for t not equal to t naught. So we have the same property that this is zero everywhere except at the point where the pulse happens, but the integral is still gonna be equal to one, right? So we've just shifted everything. We have the same property that the integral of delta of t minus t naught is still gonna be equal to one as we go from negative infinity to infinity. Okay, so now this is the function that we'd like to take the uh, Laplace transform of. This will be the most general formula that we can get of our shifted impulse. So we'll have our impulse at a fixed point, t equals t naught. So to do this, to compute the Laplace transform, which I'll just call the LT, the Laplace transform, let's consider the following formula. So um, we can do this by taking a limit of the d sub tau function that we took before. So the Laplace transform of our delta, delta of t minus t naught, right? This is gonna be equal to the limit, just because of, remember, the Laplace transform is linear. Um, everything's gonna work out here. We, we'll, we'll verify that uh, we get a reasonable answer from this. But this is gonna be given by the limit as tau approaches uh, zero from the right of the Laplace transform of that function d sub tau t minus t naught. So the shifted, the shifted uh, rectangular impulse function, right? Um, so now what we wanna do is first compute this Laplace transform and then we'll worry about taking the limit. So the Laplace transform of d sub tau t minus t naught this is by definition the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st d sub tau of t minus t naught dt. And now we wanna take advantage of the definition, the definition of this function, right? So the first thing that we should notice here is that for small enough t, uh, t minus t naught, sorry, t minus tau, t minus tau is going to be positive, right? So for small, t, t minus tau will be greater than zero. All right, um, I think I, I have this backwards, sorry. Tau minus t is gonna be greater than zero. Tau minus t is gonna be greater than zero. Um, no, I had it right the first time, sorry. Sorry, yeah, t minus tau. Okay. So I have said this slightly wrong, right? It's not for, it's not for small t, but um, eventually for, for t close enough to t naught. So in my mind, I was doing this at the origin, right? But we wanna do this at t naught, right? So for t close to t naught, then actually what we get is that t minus t naught is gonna be greater than tau, sorry, less than tau, less than tau. It's gonna be within the interval, the whole point here. I am struggling through this, but um, the whole point here is that eventually um, t minus t naught, right, will be inside of this interval. It'll be inside of this interval, all right? And so that's what we're, that's what we're looking for here, all right? And so now, <laughs> once we believe what I'm saying here, right, so for t close to t naught, then this uh, value here is gonna be less than tau, and so then we can rewrite the integral Remember the definition of our function is that it equals one over two tau close to t naught. So in this case, it's gonna be t naught, right? Uh, so this will be t minus t naught here. This is what we're replacing this with for our shifted function, uh, but it's zero otherwise. And so the integral is not gonna care about the zero portion. And we just have to take the, uh, the integral on this port, on this, this interval, right? So here's what we end up with after all of this uh, kind of blabbering, uh, analysis is that we can replace this integral by the integral from t naught minus tau to t naught plus tau. So there's a, the symmetric interval of length tau centered around t naught, right? Because um, everything else is gonna be zero. And so d sub tau t minus t naught dt. And then we can replace this function right here by its definition, right? Its definition is that it's equal to, on this interval, it's equal to one over two tau, and it's zero everywhere else, right? And we already took advantage of the zero part, but now we can write this as one over two tau, t 
times the integral from t naught minus tau to t naught plus tau of just e to the minus st dt. And when we compute this integral, this can now just be computed, right? We get a uh, one over s, um, negative one over s, right? e to the minus st, we plug in these boundaries, and so this can then be rewritten, and this is a little bit of an exercise to make sure that when you plug in these, uh, these two boundaries here, then the t naught will come out. You'll be able to factor out e to the s minus s t naught, and you'll get the following. So let me write it down. You'll get 1 over 2 times s times tau, and I switched the order in ter because of this minus sign here, and then uh, what's left is going to be e to the minus s t naught. That part's going to be in common, and then these two are not going to be common, right? They're going to be slightly different, and so then it's going to be e to the s tau minus e to the minus s tau. All right, and so actually this one comes out of, of the top and this one comes out of the bottom when you plug these in. So if you need to take, take a moment now to pause the video and make sure that this integral right here, this definite integral, truly can be written in this form. Um, and just, just check that, just make sure that that works out. And then what we notice, but so once you've done that, what we notice then is that this can be written as um, 1 over s times tau uh, times this 1 half can go in, right? So this is an e to the s tau minus e to the minus s tau over 2 times this function, right? e to the minus s t naught. All of this depends on tau. Remember, we're going to call a limit back in that the limit is going to work on tau, right? So this, this term right here is a constant with respect to tau. This term is not. We need to take the limit of this as tau approaches zero from the right. Notice that this function is the hyperbolic sine function. This is cinch. This is cinch, right? And so this whole thing can be rewritten as cinch hyperbolic sine of s tau, right, over s tau. So e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. That's cinch of x. And then this is all multiplied by e to the minus st naught. So there's the Laplace transform of d sub tau, and now to get the Laplace transform of delta, we need to take the limit of what we just got as tau approaches infinity from the right. Okay, and so now, this what this then tells us, right, is that the Laplace transform of delta t minus t naught is going to be the limit as tau approaches zero from the right of, um, I'm going to write this slightly differently, the limit's only going to work on this first part, so I'm going to write it as follows. Cinch of s tau over s tau times e to the minus s t naught. All right. Um, this limit is indeterminate. Cinch of 0 is 0. Obviously, s times 0 is 0, right? So this is 0 over 0. You can use L'Hopital's rule on this, and I'm not going to work out the details right now, but you can. L'Hopital's rule is very straightforward. So L'Hopital's rule with respect to tau, so s is a constant and tau is the variable. If you apply L'Hopital's rule to this, you will find that this limit is 1, all right? And so pause the video now and, and do that if you need to. Um, but this is going to then be 1 by L'Hopital's rule, right, times e to the minus s t naught. And so what we have found is that the Laplace transform of delta t minus t naught is equal to e to the minus s times t naught. Okay, so this is the Laplace transform of the delta function for any constant t naught, any constant t naught. In particular, what is the Laplace transform then of just delta of t where it's not shifted, right? And so we see now that the Laplace transform just by you know, comparison here, the Laplace transform of delta of t is going to be e to the minus s times 0, t naught is 0 in this case, right, which is just 1. So the Laplace transform of delta of t is equal to 1. All right, so there's a couple facts that we've learned from this. So Laplace transform of the impulse function is 1, a Laplace transform of a shifted impulse function, though, is e to the minus s times t naught, and t naught then is the location of that impulse. All right, before we do uh, an example of solving an initial value problem, the, in the whole process of solving the initial value problem is going to be exactly the same. So what we've just done is kind of the most important part of this lecture. But um, 
I'd just like to write out uh, one recommended exercise, but this is a very important property of the delta function, which is what in some sense makes this uh, distribution and makes it useful in future classes. But so this is a re very recommended exercise. You should you should definitely do this one. But what I'd like you to do is repeat a similar argument to the one that we just did to compute this uh, Laplace transform. So similar, not exactly the same. It's actually kind of easier what we're what I'm going to write down here in a moment. But um, repeat a similar similar argument um, to show that the following is true. So to show that the integral from minus infinity to infinity of delta of t minus t naught times any function f of t dt, this is going to be equal to f of t naught. So this just picks out the value of f of t naught, all right, and it gets rid of everything else. So um, this is this is definitely worth working out the details for. The argument is very similar to what we did up here. So replace this with d d sub tau. Uh, compute the integral, take the limit. You know, you can only do so much with the integral, but take the limit, and then you'll see exactly uh, how this how this works out. And this this result is absolutely true and very useful. Like I said, in future classes, especially in functional analysis and partial differential equations. All right, let's do one example of solving an initial value problem involving one of these delta functions on the right hand side. Or actually, the problem I have has two delta functions on the right hand side. So this one's y double prime plus 4y equals delta of t minus pi minus delta of t minus 2 pi. And the initial values are both 0. So y of 0 equals 0, and y prime of 0 equals 0. And let's see how this goes. So we need to first start by taking the Laplace transform. Since these are zeros, the Laplace transform uh, of the equation, I'll just write it like this, the L is going to give us the following. It's going to give us S squared capital Y plus 4 capital Y equals, remember the Laplace transform here is going to be, so we just worked this out, right? Laplace transform of delta T minus T naught is equal to E to the minus S T naught. So this one's going to be E to the minus pi S minus E to the minus 2 pi S. Right, so that's exactly what we have there. And now what we need to do is, as usual, right, uh, try to solve for capital Y and then do the inverse Laplace transform. So up to this point, everything we've done is, you know, it's good to go. Everything is, is perfect here, right? And so now we factor out our S squared plus 4, capital Y. On this side, we still have our E to the minus pi S minus E to the minus 2 pi S. And then when we write this out, as we've done in the past, I'm going to separate this. So it's e to the minus pi s times 1 over s squared plus 2 squared. I'm going to write it this way so that we can see what the transform is going to be. And then minus e to the minus 2 pi s, same thing, 1 over s squared plus 2 squared. All right, these are uh, close, very close to being perfect transforms. So first of all, we have... We're, these are going to be shifted, right? But we have our e to the minus cs um, times the Laplace transform of a, of a function here, right, of some function. And the function is going to be, this is s squared plus a squared, right, on the bottom. But we need an a on top. So we need to have a 2 on top. This is the a, right, the 2. So we need to multiply by 2 up here, which means we need to divide, <coughs> divide excuse me, by 2 out here. we got to do this for both of them, right? But these are both, this is very straightforward with these delta functions because we have, you know, everything we need here. And so our Laplace transform uh, is going to be, so now we apply, well, let's rewrite this now. So I'm going to write it as follows, okay? So y is going to equal 1 half e to the minus pi s times um, the Laplace transform of, this is going to be sine of 2t. So the Laplace transform of sine of 2t, this is going to help us shift it, right? Minus a half e to the minus 2 pi s times the Laplace transform of the same thing, right? Sine of 2t. So these are the same. And then remember how this works when you have e to the minus cs times a function, then what you have to do is you have to multiply by the, uh, the unit step function, right, times uh, the shifted function. So this means our little y is going to be 1 half 
times u sub pi of t times the shifted function here. So this is going to be then sine of 2 times t minus pi, right? 2 times t minus pi minus 1 half u sub 2 pi of t times the shifted function sine of 2 times t minus 2 pi. All right. This one is exactly, you know, it's exactly correct. I mean, we can kind of leave it this way, right? But t minus 2 pi, that's just going to be sine of t because sine is 2 pi periodic, right? Um, so this is doubled, though. So, yeah, I mean, we, we can we can multiply this out, and then you can apply some some formulas if you want. But basically, this is the gist of it. So let's just leave it like this, right? I'm going to multiply through. Yeah, let's just leave it, actually. I think it's okay. I think we get the idea, right? So we have our, our step function, u sub pi, um, times this function, sine of t minus pi, 2 times t minus pi, minus a half of the step function, right? So then it's going to, so this is going to ramp it up, right? Starting at pi, and then this is going to take it away at 2 pi. And so what you end up with is a portion of the sine of 2, essentially what this looks like, right, is 1 half of the sine function um, from pi to 2 pi. So basically the graph looks like the following. If we just use our intuition here, right, the solution function to this differential equation, basically the first delta turns on the signal and the second one turns it off, right? And in between, what's it look like? So we've got here our function little y, here's our value t, we have pi, we have 2 pi. I'm going to spread them out like this, it's not really symmetric, right? So the idea now is that this function, right, this differential equation is not turned on. So the impulse function turns on the signal at pi, and then it turns off the signal, the minus sign turns off the signal at 2 pi, and so outside of those, the function is just zero, and that's what the two step functions do, right? So it looks like this, and so I'm obeying the step function rules, right? So it's open here and closed here. And then in between, uh, let's say this is a height of one half, what does it do? Well, now our function picks up, remember this is a shifted, this is shifted, right? So uh, sine of, basically the graph of sine of two t starts here, right? And then it goes to here. So you get a whole period actually. You get a whole period. So because it's two t and the, the interval, so so the frequency is doubled, right? And, and the, uh, interval here is half of a normal period so this goes down then to minus a half and this is going to look exactly like this that should be about halfway and so the graph of the solution this is the solution now this is all one curve but this is the solution y equals y of t the solution to the differential equation y double prime plus 4y equals this, on the right-hand side, these impulses are like switches, right? So it's turn it on, turn it off. So we have nothing, turn it on, it goes to 2 pi, turn it off, and then 0 again. And so there's the solution. That's what the graph of this function right here looks like. That's the solution of the differential equation. Um, for this one, you know, again, you could rewrite this now based on what you, what you see right here. You could rewrite this, um, you know, in a, in a different form if you want, but just interpreting it was good enough for me. So we can see what it looks like. We've solved it. It all makes sense. We understand what the delta functions are doing. And so this is how we solve a initial value problem using, or with it involves the delta functions using the Laplace transform method. So I'm going to leave this one here and I'll see you guys in the next one.